Well, I have noon on my watch here, so we are going to get started. Welcome, everyone, to our discussion of increasing employee engagement, which is being co-hosted by the Quinlan School of Business and the Parkinson School of Health Sciences and Public Health. I'm Seth Green, and I am proud, especially on an afternoon like this one, to say that I'm the founding director of the Baumhart Center here at Loyola University, Chicago. And we have an exciting agenda for you. We are gonna start with a welcome and strategic overview from Elaine Murado, the founding dean of our Parkinson School. Then we're gonna hear an expert perspective on mental health and the role of employers from Gautam Menon, the dean of our social work school, as well as someone with an MBA and a passion for connecting social work and business. And then we're gonna move into employer case studies. And there's no one better than Catherine Pisco, Director of Goodness Solutions at Benevity, who is working with corporations across the country and across the world to put these ideas into action. And then most importantly, we're gonna to come to your questions and have a rich discussion with all of you. So with that, let me turn it over to Dean Murado for her opening. Thank you very much, Seth. And thank you all for joining us on a, on a, uh, on a Monday day. Um, I um, am very delighted that um, I get to work with the Quinlan School, and I think we are trying to embrace that these uh, times are working through a pandemic together are really times for thinking differently and cross-sharing across disciplines around how we can solve common problems together better. So I like to tee it up a little bit as to always reminding us where are we on this journey um, in this pandemic. And, and this month I thought my theme could be it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, if you click next step. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, well, uh, it's good times because um, as some of you may have heard, um, we're seeing some exciting news from the vaccine front. Um, and I think it's unprecedented how quickly our healthcare system has been responding to the epidemic and innovating and finding medical solutions. And it's extremely encouraging to see the news that's coming out of both the Pfizer initiative as well as this uh, just this last day out of Moderna looking at vaccine efficacy greater than 90%, maybe as much as 95. That's extremely promising. Um, but at the same time, we're in the here and now today of November 16th. And uh, today, what are we facing is an increased surge in cases um, that is being lagged by also hospitalization and deaths. And um, I believe the statistic was we gained a million more cases in just the last week. Um, so a rapid uprise. Um, and, and with that, a need to react. Yeah, thank you, Seth, move forward, react collectively together. And I just pulled um, from the news a few headlines um, across the country, um, communities once again saying, what do we need to be doing beyond um, what we are doing in community? Um, and, and making mandates around mask wearing, uh, travel advisories, concerns around healthcare resources. And here in Chicago, uh, today is the start of the stay at home advisory um, here in Chicago and um, protect Chicago. Um, and so it brings us back in the news that we have to face the time of now. Uh, next, please. And next, please, yes. And, and I think, you know, from a public health perspective, um, go back, um, I think there's a lag. Um, yes, from a public health perspective, you know, um, let me just state the obvious. Um, this is a stressful time. Last month, our webinar series focused on mental well-being. Today, we want to take that insight and translate it to how do we actually employ or engage those that we work with in our organizations to help and find practical ways to cope with stress so that we all together can work through this as in healthy a way as we can and hopefully come out of the other end uh, stronger for it. Next, please. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation is an outstanding resource if you're wanting to look at what is the latest health policy data. And I just have here a couple of slides just to remind us how prevalent it is of what each and every one of us is facing. Um, this is data that's looking at people reporting on symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, and looking at how that's increasing over time. Their last data poll was from July but I've got to know that uh, we're at least these numbers, if not higher right now. So awareness helps first. 
everyone is going through this collectively together. Next slide, please. Um, and in particular, when we go into moments of increasing sheltering in place or increasing efforts in social isolation, that brings on even more of, of this anxiety in terms of impact. Um, and we know as some of these um, sites, including here in Chicago, going into another wave and being advised not to gather together with friends and family for the holidays, that this will put an additional strain on mental well-being. And so next slide, please. We wanted to really you know, come together and think about with our speakers here how to manage through this, knowing that as many of you've probably heard in the news, there, there is a thing called fatigue from this and COVID fatigue and it's wearing and um, how do we continue to work and come together as employees and engage with one another and consider ourselves as a social organization and what can we learn from, this, from the field of social work. So next slide. So my ask um, of all of you as we listen to our two fantastic guest speakers today all of us are representing different pieces of the puzzle here, different settings. Sometimes we're with families, sometimes we're with schools, sometimes we're with employers, and sometimes with in healthcare settings. Each of us are needing to engage one another and come together as a social animal, social communities to help us through this and, and really um, to get us to the best of times again as we bridge from where we are now to the spring and the winter when we hope to have the vaccines available and can be moving more um, back to normal times. So with that opening, I am so glad to be able to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Agatha Menon, um, who um, is the Dean of the School of Social Work here from Loyola University, Chicago, and will be sharing with us pearls of wisdom from the field of social work and how that might inform how we think about engaging with one another as we work through this together. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Dean Menon. Turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you, Sid. And thank you, Catherine, for being here and all of our guests and colleagues around uh, different fields. Uh, that, that's the exciting part. I mean, we have social workers, we have business folks, we have a whole range of occupations represented in the over 100 individuals in these tiny little squares that uh, we call home these days. Uh, my background uh, is in social work uh, uh, back in India. I started there. Um, much of my work is in chronic mental illness or in this country, they call it severe mental illness, uh, specific focus on schizophrenia and how families cope with schizophrenia. And that has been my area of work and then moved to academia and dabbled with a lot of things technology is right now for the last 20 years that's been my focus in looking at online counseling therapies those types of issues especially from the legal side of things on on hipaa and all those different things that come along with it uh, today uh, this is a very important topic uh, in the sense that um, mental health is uh, central to our functioning uh, as, as just general citizens, we don't even have to be working anywhere, but uh, even folks who are not working at home, they still need support uh, from all of us to make people whole again. Uh, next slide, uh, please sit. <clears throat> so when I look at mental health, it's an extremely broad tent that we fall under. We have all the way from neurosis to psychosis and everything in between uh, as per the DSM-5 that we typically follow. Uh, but the most important piece here is uh, mental health is extremely stigmatizing uh, and it varies from communities to communities, uh, backgrounds, worldviews, and uh, it creates a variety of emotions and uh, a sense of being in almost all of us. Certain communities uh, shame people who have mental illness. There are individuals who fear about being labeled with a particular category because that follows them right through their careers because health insurances ask if you have X, Y, and Z in, in your health uh, records. There's also this feeling of inadequacy that 
if my neighbor or my colleague could manage this, I should be able to manage this. So there is the sense of maybe there is something wrong with me in not keeping up with what needs to get done. Then there is also communities that view the mentally ill as being weak and not having the wherewithal to pull yourself up with your bootstraps and those types of mythologies that still exist these days when the environment around us has changed so much that some folks may not even be having boots to pull up uh, at this point in time. So it is extremely troubling when, when we look at this entire spectrum of disorders that we call or under the umbrella of mental health, because if you look at South Asian communities, for example, the stigma attached to it can even extend to who your partner would be when you get married or, or there are so many different pieces to it that people fear from seeking the wonderful services that are available in our communities. So they don't seek help and we will look at that data coming forward. Mental health issues are pretty common. Nearly one in five in the US, 51.5 million people in 2019 had some sort of a diagnosis uh, within that spectrum of disorders. And usually it is classified under two big umbrellas of any mental illness diagnosis. And then you have the serious mental illness of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and, and so on. So you can see the numbers there and we can bet all our money that these numbers will spike next year when this data from SAMHSA comes out, that there's going to be a, a whole range of uh, different types of entities that come into play. Next slide, please. Uh, the previous one, please. One more. Go back one more, yeah. So when you look at the prevalence rates, uh, we can see that uh, in the any mental illness, that is this entire bucket of operations, there are several indicators here that which we need to focus on. For example, uh, women are more prevalent in getting certain types of mental illnesses, especially depression and anxiety in that broad bucket. But most interestingly is when you look at the age groups, those are the age groups that typically are our employees in the large sector of things. And if this many amount of individuals are facing these types of struggles in their day-to-day -day life, there is something that we need to be intentional and deliberate about within our work settings to ensure that these individuals have a space, have a a way to express themselves and get the necessary support systems in place. Then when you look at race, ethnicity, you still see uh, several indicators on why certain of these interventions need to be targeted to get people to come on board, to either seek help, ask for help, and make it easier for them to be more responsive to what we need to do. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And this is the number that always amazes me. And this has not really budged much. That is the, the last line in red at the bottom. Um, less than 50% of that 55 million seek help. And that is where the stigma and everything else comes into play. Stigma, lack of health insurance, uh, lack of the ability to connect with therapists from their own backgrounds to be comfortable, or the feelings that they do, the therapist may not understand my background. There are so many different variables that come into play within that sector that unless that is improved, and that is where I think organizations have a role to play to somehow try to make it that this is not something unique about you, but everybody needs the help and everybody needs to be able to function in effective ways. So reducing the stigma becomes an integral part of any HR or any organizational structure 
on the way in which we can go about doing these different things. So we are now in this pandemic, but then we have the other pandemic of racism and all those different things. And I see uh, one of the postings uh, uh, which is there with regards to all of those things sort of intersected in 2020. And that is something that is troubling that we will, we have to just wait to see what's going to happen because there are so many different variables intersecting with each other in, in, in us trying to be the best we can in, in, the, in the support systems that we can provide to our communities in question. Next slide, please. So when you look at current surveys that are coming out, uh, it is pretty obvious, Elaine touched upon that uh, a little bit a while ago. Uh, we are just at the beginning end of the different types of studies and uh, already the numbers are showing that stress, burning out, discouragement, being distracted at work, feeling depressed, those numbers are already uh, rising in the sense of uh, the way in which uh, employees feel. And again, there is a disproportionate number of women being affected uh, in, in this whole uh, enterprise because uh, for better or worse, uh, women have other roles to play or are looked at to play other roles within their structure, family or otherwise, community or otherwise, that there is that added pressure to do multiple things at the same time. This doesn't mean that the men are not doing whatever they need to be doing, but there is that disproportionality when it comes to the way in which perceptions of stress, or I would not even call it perceptions, these are actual beings in terms of where they are in their state of mind. Uh, next slide, please. So Elaine touched upon the social animal factor. We are social animals. And that is how our brains are wired. Some of us who are introverts, we are still social animals because we need to function in society in such a way that many wear masks to, figuratively masks to function in a non-pandemic uh, situation. That is, they will put forth a very positive, confident types of approaches, but that is, a survival skill that they need to navigate the many nuances that happen within organizational culture, organizational politics, organizational support systems or lack thereof. So when you look at Lieberman's work in 2013, our essential social system, especially in the Western world, is to make connections with others and experience emotions. And that is how we grow. We go through pain, we go through elation, we go through a variety of different factors that helps us understand what others are thinking of us, of the task at hand, of just relationships within these different structures that we try to interact with. And then all the while on the third legged stool, our brain is trying to figure out how do we harmonize with others so that you can survive, you can thrive. It goes back to the classic survival of the fittest sort of entity where you're trying to balance out multiple factors and then trying to provide that safe space for yourself moving forward. Social distancing is not natural for us, uh, especially in the Western world. It is not in India. It, you can forget about it because you can't walk in a street without 20 people around you trying to navigate you, the way you go, you know, so that because there is crowd, the density populations are so high in some countries. Staying in place is claustrophobic. I mean, I would love to get out because I'm stuck in this room from seven in the morning to eight in the night, just sitting in front of a Zoom meeting. So there are certain things that are unnatural within our functioning at this point in time, which we need to be taken care of. Remote work is not everyone's cup of tea. I mean, we are not, a lot of us are not used to that. Next slide, please. Um, 
I'm just going to run down a, a variety of things uh, just for a matter of time and we can uh, have discussions later. Uh, schools, essentially they are safety nets for us in terms of we drop the kids off and we go to work and we don't have to worry about them from eight to five or whatever. That option is gone at this point in time. We don't have time for respite in terms of we don't have time for ourselves to think or, or just be ourselves in our little space. Wages follows that I think last week we all touched about that with regards to the uncertainty of finances. Not everybody has the best technology available to them. Access becomes a problem for many people and organizations need to be sort of aware of what is going on. Your home was your home. Now it's a glass house in terms of you have cats running across your table during Zoom. You have so many different things happening that not everyone has the luxury of having a workspace uh, in, in, in the small apartments or condos that people live in. So how do we make that not the new normal, but how do we work towards adjusting to that? Then you have the issue of domestic violence within strained personal relationships where now you are in extended time, you are with that individual in the home without a way to get out. So that adds to the stress, the fear, the violence and, and so on and so forth. So there's so much more going on within that realm. Next slide, please. So as an employer, for me, it's always been about empathy, that is leading and managing with empathy. And what I mean by reflecting on your becoming journey is that we all started somewhere. We all did not, we were not born with a silver spoon in our mouth. We all came up the hard way, or at least the majority of us came up the hard way. And those are lessons that we should not forget. Whatever position we are in, I may be a dean now, but I still need to understand what my janitor feels about something because I have cleaned toilets at you know Stable Illinois Urbana Champagne when I was a grad student. You know, so we cannot forget our past. We need to be able to relate and be able to understand the other side of those individuals and treat them the way that they should be treated. We also have a responsibility of power and privilege. We are some of us have power and privilege in the positions we hold our whole use that for the common good in the time of a crisis. Speak up when something is not equitable across all of your staff in the organization and, and so on. So we need to be pretty much good with that, noticing what is going on and have the courage to lay it out that this is not working and speak for somebody else. You know, you're not speaking for your own, but you're speaking for somebody else. Always ask, how can I help? Or how can I do this? Or how can I help you do this differently? Rather than why didn't you and just launch into a tirade of you drop the ball or blah. All of us are going to drop the ball in this crisis situation. So being gentle, being humble, being kind becomes extremely important. Remind frequently about the support systems that exist due because of their working with you in terms of HR benefits, those types of things, because at a time of crisis, people forget what they have. So constantly reminding them, hey, you have critical health insurance or you have long-term disability, reminding them of that on a consistent basis helps to reduce the stress moving forward. Next slide, please. And again, it goes back to being kind, calls to check on well-being, uh, just notes, just a short text message. Hey, how are you doing today? How are you feeling today? It's not about always meeting targets. or meet, Those are important, but you do have to have a, a, a gentleness with regards to reading the room, as to say, in terms of what is actually going on within the lives of these individuals. Uh, have... Uh, a book club, watch a movie together. I mean, those are all things that takes your mind off your work all the time, but have some sort of a way to connect. In, at my holiday parties, I always invite all of the family. So kids come in, they all get to know each other. 
then one kid knows, hey, why is my mom working so hard? Because the other kid will say, oh yeah, my mom also. So it sort of normalizes what happens. So we have a huge party, 120, 100 people there and they have a good time and they leave. So they all can interact with each other moving forward. One needs to assess the home office situation and I cannot state that more because we tend to believe that everybody has X, Y, and Z. Now, how do we bring it together and not wait for somebody to say, hey, I don't have a webcam or feel embarrassed to ask. So make it some way to collect that information so that you provide all that they need, working in pods of support, two or three individuals, just checking on each other on a regular basis helps and find opportunities to find purpose by doing work. And that's where Catherine's work is so important because we all want to feel connected to the whole in, in whatever way. We may not have the time or the talent, but how do we sort of navigate what we can collectively moving forward? Next slide, please. And again, this too shall pass. I mean, I, I like to write notes. Uh, when somebody does something, I just do a handwritten note. It's just those simple things that sort of keeps people engaged moving forward and get feedback from your employees on what you can do when you come back. So have that hope of this is not the new normal. There is going to be life in eight months time once everybody gets vaccinated. Now, how are we getting ready for that piece of it rather than just dwelling in what we are in today? So get good ideas now, hey, we can do this differently and so on. There will be workforce displacements. There is no doubt about it. Uh, a lot of the jobs are going to go remote more permanently. Now, how are we preparing or upskilling individuals to take on those roles? And I can, that, that's where I think Loyola and other universities come into play where you can figure out like Elaine had these one credit courses. Those are all upskilling opportunities to sort of improve your repertoire of skill sets so that you're ready for that displacement. The displacement is going to happen, but how we get there is the most important piece. Finally, it's the social work thing of starting where the client is. That is, we need to know exactly what the employee needs and be able to offer it to them in meaningful ways. And that is central to keeping the whole group together. We are all in this together moving forward. We just need to work together getting there. And last slide, I think it is. Uh, I like this quote. I'm a big science fiction fan. Uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, the trilogy, all, all, all of these things. So, and this quote sort of touched me in the sense that, yes, we are in, in a lot of peril and disruption, but there is always that element of love and trust that will over sort of shadow all the pain we are going through at this point in time. So with that, I will end and then hand it to Catherine. Well, let me just say a huge thank you, Dean Menon, for that, I mean, really comprehensive and powerful overview of what's happening in the mental health world in this moment. It is sobering to hear those stats and understand how the unique stressors of this moment have dramatically added to the numbers of people that are experiencing these challenging times. And then to look at all the different facets of leadership that are needed. Um, and what we're now gonna do is go into one of those places, right? Because you talked about a number of different levels of leadership, being there and empathetic, really understanding the unique assessment of each person and what they need and what their home needs to be set up and making sure they still feel community. And it's that last one that we're gonna now dive deep into. And Catherine Pisco is the Director of Goodness Solutions at Benevity. And she sees into this uniquely because they are partnering with companies that are figuring out how do we engage and mobilize our workplace in this moment? And so Catherine, let me turn it over to you for some of your examples, which will um, come to many of the awesome questions that are already lighting up the chat. And that's just a great segue because after Catherine, we are coming to your questions. So keep lighting it up in there with questions you have for either or both speakers and Dean Murado as well. Catherine. 
Thanks so much, Seth. Uh, really feel honored to be able to uh, talk a little bit today and uh, even more uh, honored to be speaking in the same uh, opportunity with uh, Dean Menon and Dean Murata. I really appreciate the, the insights that you shared. And today, you know, as Seth said, I'll be focusing a little bit more on, on one of those pieces that Dean Menon touched on, which is how to help employees find purpose by doing good. Um, but I really, I was really struck by all of the statistics um, regarding, you know, and related to mental health. And really, I, as I was reflecting, it made me feel very lucky to work for a company like Benevity, where I do feel supported from a mental health perspective. I mean, can't tell you how many times some of my little kids have joined Zoom calls and unnecessarily um, during this time. And, you know, we've mental well-being sessions offered twice a week. Um, and other virtual events to really keep us connected. And I think they've gone a long way. And of course we can, we can do more, but just um, that's shown me a small example of how companies can play a role from the um, really supporting employees around, around mental health during this time. Um, to start, I guess, and give the, the group a little context. It was so great. I so appreciated everyone kind of noting um, who they were and where they're from, so I can kind of cater the remarks. But Benevity is a, a B corporation. Uh, we're based in um, Calgary, uh, Canada. And um, we are, uh, our goal as a company, our mission is to really um, uh, in, act as a catalyst to infuse a culture of goodness in the world. So really helping people, helping companies help their employees, uh, be the best versions of themselves every day. And we found that a tremendous way to engage people is by supporting them in doing good. Um, we, what we call goodness. So things like volunteering, things like giving money to causes that you care about and things that one trend we've really seen during COVID and beyond has been really encouraging your employees to just be kind and do random acts of kindness. And so all things that I think uh, weave in nicely to what Dean Menon touched on as well. Um, and so today I'll touch on three main ways that we're seeing that. So philanthropic giving and how volunteering and doing these acts of kindness really do help um, employees feel more engaged and, and really find their personal purpose through doing good. Um, I always like to, thanks um, Seth for uh, moving to this slide because I always like to kind of start off discussions with this by the why too. Um, and I think we already heard a lot about why engaging employees is really important, but I pulled a couple stats that I found really um, interesting. Um, first, kind of a sobering one, unfortunately, but a Gallup actually estimates that only about a third of employees are actually very engaged at work. Um, over half are disengaged, and it's estimated that about 16% of employees are actively disengaged. And to translate that from a business perspective, it's estimated that those actively engaged employees actually can cost the U.S. about between 483 and 605 billion dollars per year in lost productivity. And I thought that was striking. On the other hand, when employees are engaged, we see data that shows that productivity increases, absenteeism decreases, um, there's less likelihood that employees will turn over. Um, and it also leads to increased quality and safety on teams. And so, as I mentioned before, we see, at least from Benevity's perspective, and um, uh, you know, Benevity provides technology for companies to do giving, volunteering, grant making, um, and we've seen that um, when companies support their people in these aspects and what we call goodness, employees are more satisfied in their jobs. They also feel a deeper connection to the company that they work for. And we've even seen that by engaging employees in things like skills-based volunteering, it actually makes them better leaders, more likely to be promoted. And we see that actually affect um, even women and, and people of color, even, even at a greater impact. So, so many reasons uh, to be focused on, on engaging employees. Seth, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Um, so clearly we're seeing kind of these trends and statistics that illustrate why it's important to engage. Um, for the balance, I'll kind of offer a couple examples of some, some of our clients in our community are, are doing this really well. Um, we have seen even before COVID that there's been a kind of a rapid acceleration and evolution of what, you know, the meaning of corporate purpose is and the role that, that um, corporations really play in connecting their employees to finding their own personal purpose. We've seen that employees are 
asking more and more and looking to their employers to provide opportunities to give back or to, um, or to really um, uh, engage in a deeper way. Um, Seth, if you could move to the next slide. I pulled a couple because we, we kind of started off the discussion today um, focused on, on COVID and kind of the results. These are some of the impacts that we've seen um, just over an eight week stint from March to May after COVID that our client community was really able to really powerfully um, respond. You know, we saw over $640 million of donations through our platform, um, 786,000 volunteer hours and 53,000 small acts of kindness um, uh, recorded. And so even here at Benevity, we announced a matching campaign um, with the fundraising goal of $300,000 to go towards charities that were supporting COVID relief. And within three and a half hours, it was up to $1.3 million supporting almost 500 causes. And so while these uh, best of times and worst of times, I think that kind of tells a story as well. While it's such a challenging time to see um, employees respond in that way around these major movements happening now is heartening. And I think as you know, one thing we've learned is to continue to allow employees to, to do, to find their personal purpose through giving, volunteering, doing small acts of kindness, um, they respond in droves. Seth, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next. So real quickly, I'll touch a little bit on employee engagement and giving and what that means. Um, philanthropic giving can be, you know, a fantastic way to really engage employees. And it's, it's difficult. I want to preface by saying we all know that, especially during the time we're in now, not everyone has extra money to be donating. Um, and so I want to be really cognizant of that. That's not always an inclusive way of engaging uh, your employees, but taken in um, conglomeration with volunteering or small acts of kindness. It's a really amazing, um, you know, we saw clients once COVID hit like Google and Microsoft launching giving campaigns or for their employees or adding extra corporate match budgets so that if you know they're matching two for one for every dollar that you donate. Um, for the purpose of today, I'll touch on two kind of unique ways um, or unique kind of trends we're seeing around giving as a way of, of really engaging folks. Um, next slide, please. First is, um, you know, we've seen a significant shift in our own global client community. Um, towards supporting inclusion, actually at the community level. In June, for instance, we saw employee and corporate contributions to causes focused on racial justice and equity increase by 15 times. And in our 12 year history as a company, we've never seen a groundswell of support, um, anything like this for any one cause area. We saw, we set a new monthly donation record crossing $300 million for 64,000 causes. And really, you know, to us, this showed that, you know, people want change. Uh, they want an outlet for that change and are really willing to put their, their dollars behind it. And I think the reason this is um, uh, unique is that we're starting to see a trend around so many of the different movements happening, especially in 2020, that folks are really using their dollars and putting them behind some of these movements in a big way. Um, the other story, if we can move to the next um, slide, that's interesting to share is the concept of peer matching, um, especially as you look at companies that many companies like to match their employees donations, which is a great way of really supporting your employees and showing them that you care about what they care about. Uh, we launched something called peer matching this year, and many of our clients have followed suit and it's been a fantastic way you know you really care about it shows that not only does your company care about what you care about, but also your peers care. So for instance, um, we had someone um, uh, that posted in the Benevity client, um, in the Benevity platform, excuse me, a uh, giving campaign focused on justice and equity for black people. I donated $20. Benevity matched $20 and then my peers matched that amount as well. And so it was just a way to not only feel supported by my, my company around something I care about, but also um, from, from the peer community, from your peers. Um, there is no kind of more special thing than, than also connecting with, with my colleagues there. We can move to the next slide. I'll transition briefly into kind of reimagining volunteering as a way of engaging employees. Um, as many of you probably know, just anecdotally, volunteering um, has tremendous uh, health and well-being effects, actually. Uh, volunteering is better for your health. It's good for your mood. It reduces stress levels. 
Um, 77% of people say company sponsored volunteer activities are actually essential to employee well being. So there's such a such a case for why, why and how volunteering actually is is wonderful for engaging the employee. But with the onset of COVID, um, it's really made it challenging. Most of the time before volunteering happened in person with a nonprofit um, in a space that we can no longer really um, be even close proximity. And so we've really seen that some of the folks that have um, done really well on the volunteering front during this time have focused on virtual volunteering. So I have two quick examples of that. And then I'll close with um, kind of an example of doing small acts of kindness. Seth, if you could move to the next slide. Viacom CBS, for instance, um, many of your companies um, it, it may have something like a, a day of service or a week of service. And we've seen a lot of organizations that haven't been able to do that this year. Viacom CVS did a really interesting thing where they did it all virtually. They engaged all of their existing nonprofit partners and they did really unique sessions, things that weren't necessarily um, uh, traditional volunteering, but let's do a brainstorm session with our nonprofit partners as, as to how we can best support you. Or let's um, uh, host a panel discussion for parents around creative lesson planning and online learning for kids. So just a couple examples, and I'm happy to share more, you know, either in the Q&A or offline, um, of ways to, to think about volunteering in a different way. Do it online, even though we're all probably sick of staring like at the Hollywood squares. I love that reference. Um, although it made me feel a little bit like a celebrity. So I'll admit I kind of enjoyed that. But, you know, so ways that we can bring people together, even when it's not in person. Next slide, please. One Main Financial is another great example. They completely redefined what volunteering meant. You know, traditionally volunteering is you track a number of hours of time that you spend volunteering to a specific nonprofit. And they kind of opened that up and said, if you're doing something good for the world, it should count, right? And it really empowered people. It was a super inclusive way of saying, it matters if you do something nice. And so they allowed things like buying groceries for people um, that were quarantined or driving someone to a medical appointment to be tracked and, and, and um, uh, even rewarded um, for volunteer hours. So I thought that was interesting. The last thing I'd like to touch on is just um, a way of kind of activating employees around movements. Again, um, not everyone has time, not everyone has money to give, but how can you engage those people that might never, you know, might feel unseen in this process or, or really have never done it before? And we um, have seen at, here at Benevity, we have a module within the technology called Missions. And we can move to the next um, slide. It's a way of, uh, it's supporting employees to take small acts, make small acts of kindness or goodness around big issues, things like DNI, sustainability, employee health and well being, mental health, civic engagement, COVID 19, and tracking activities, small bite sized activities. And of course, within the platform, we have it gamified and it tracks and kind of shows you where you are with your peers. But even if you don't have technology, these are things that you as an employer, um, can really empower your employees to do just small things, but show them that it makes that it makes a difference. Next slide, please. We found um, the staggering thing we saw is when companies support their employees in doing this, it brings people in to doing this sort of work, these acts of goodness, and really engages them in ways that we've never seen before. So, you know, it really does a great job in engaging remote workforces, which I guess we're kind of all remote these days, but international teams. Um, 38% of the employees engaged for the first time through this missions module. Um, that had never ever done anything before. And then 30% of those people went on to give or volunteer or do more. And so it's just, it really shows that while it might seem small, you know, a company might think, okay, I'm really gonna give someone credit for, you know, delivering someone's groceries, but it inspires people to do more. And not only do the employees feel great about it, their mental health gets a boost, but um, employers reap the benefits as well when they see that their employees are much more engaged. Finally, I'll share an example of this. Missions, um, for, uh, next slide, please. 
um, there, we have a sustainability mission, for instance. This is an example of what PayPal did. They encouraged all of their employees to do small acts around uh, different sustainability initiatives. So adopting food habits that lower emissions, reducing paper use, switching on and off light switches, little everyday things, you know, water conservation, you can cut two minutes off of your shower or um, only wash your hair twice a week, whatever. I'm a fan of that one personally. Um, and what they found was people were doing these small things. It was um, our missions module actually adds up, okay, how much water has been saved, not only by you for doing these small actions, but across the whole company as well. And it's a really powerful story to show that you matter, no matter who you are or where you are, what you do matters. And um, look at what can happen when you take, when collectively you take the impact from across um, the boards and your, your, all of your, um, your fellow, uh, your peers as well. So shared a ton of info with you today um, with the goal of really highlight, highlighting at least th three key ways that we at least at Benevity have seen companies successfully engage their employees through philanthropic giving, volunteering, and really just encouraging these small acts of kindness. Um, and at the end of the day, I think if you remember one thing, it's simply letting your employees know that you as an employer care about what they care about and that what they care about matters um, and you really can't go wrong. Thanks so much for the opportunity and looking forward to, to fielding questions with, with the rest of the group. Thank you, Catherine and Dean Menon for powerful presentations. And as you said, Catherine, we are headed into questions and we have many of them for this phenomenal panel. And I will mention since I've stopped sharing my screen that I encourage you to go to speaker view and you will see our three experts in front of you. And so I want to come first, uh, Sigil Shaw Myers, you had a question in the chat. I'll let you ask it live. Thanks, Seth. Um, acknowledging the power dynamic between corporation and foundations, how do we ensure we're driving real impact to nonprofits and not using them to fulfill the engagement need? And not to put you on the spot, Catherine, but maybe we'll start with you and then invite in uh, our deans if they have additional thoughts. That's a great question and thank you. Um, one thing I didn't touch on um, because I wanted to keep my, the comments kind of uh, focused on employee engagement, but is 100% the other piece of, um, at least within our platform, and I can kind of speak with at least the Benevity hat on, we work with um, over 2 million nonprofits that are actually in the platform. And the reason our technology was created is really to, first and foremost, to try to make it easier for nonprofits to receive money from corporations, um, easier to facilitate connection between nonprofits and corporations. Um, and so one thing we think a lot about is, um, and we actually have a whole um, causes portal that is dedicated to um, you know, really promoting the initiatives. Uh, we encourage our um, nonprofit partners to uh, create giving opportunities specifically for their corporate partners, um, as well as um, uh, really have visibility in the platform. So for us, it's um, at least the, the role we at Benevity view uh, as playing is really being that connector between between the two sides. We've heard oftentimes we have a um, Benevity nonprofit uh, community council, which are leaders from uh, about a dozen different uh, leading nonprofits, global nonprofits that kind of help inform different features, functionality, uh, ways that we um, run the technolo tech technology platform. And one thing we hear is um, that's something that we could always be looking towards is how can we really increase that visibility because of that power dynamic. So it's not a one way, um, great, we're checking the box, we're volunteering here. Is it really useful um, to uh, nonprofit partners? In my past life, I. Um, ran my own business that helped connect international nonprofits with skills-based volunteers. And I found that I had to be speaking a completely different language at times when talking to my uh, the corporate friends um, to really help unpack um, what's important uh, to, mm. to our nonprofit partners so that it doesn't miss the mark. <laughs> um, and so I think your question's a good one. I wish, I think if someone had has figured it out so far, I want to listen to them talk all day. We're constantly really trying to um, increase that that visibility and, and that conversation to break down the barriers. But 
Um, I know it doesn't completely answer the question, but something I know at least Ep and Ebony were thinking very deeply about. Heather Milnick, you have our next question. Thanks, Beth. Um, I work for one of the small nonprofits that you, a lot of folks are referring to and that is presentation and I, so I definitely appreciate those ideas from the, you know, on the corporate side of things. But um, my question is really any suggestions for keeping those who are in the helping professions engaged? You know, our jobs revolve around already doing the things that you're suggesting as, you know, engagement. Um, and so there's, you know, compassion fatigue is a real thing. And, you know, not having that connectedness, even being in the office with fellow staff to kind of debrief with and that kind of thing is creating a lot of challenges. So even things like our holiday celebration, you know, we can't all be together to do that. Just any suggestions around um, engagement or support for, for folks who are in those helping professions. And Dean Menon, not to put you on the spot, but it feels like it's right up your alley, given that you are there for the people who are there for others. And I'm curious, starting with you, but then we'll come to the full panel. Uh, sure. Uh, I was just uh, typing something for Heather, but uh, I can talk. Uh, I, th I think engagement uh, comes in different flavors. So yes, it would be great to engage your staff to the community and, and have metrics to measure how much they have contributed, whatever. But I believe engagement can also be done in-house with each other. Uh, it could be just to decompress, to have book clubs, movies to watch together, your favorites. That is an engagement activity by itself, but the outcome might be to improve motivation, improve a sense of a professional family, so on and so forth. So I think we got to be careful on, on what we define and measure the metrics of engagement. One is external going to what Sejal mentioned with regards to it has value to gaining traction with donors. Hey, this organization is doing X, Y, and Z. But for smaller nonprofits, smaller health service organizations, that engagement internally itself is a good thing for folks to be with each other and, and figure out ways to navigate what we are in today. So that's at least my initial thoughts uh, of, on that, but it's a great question. May I build on that, Seth? Yeah, of course. Um, one of the uh, nuggets or pearls I took away from um, our expert panel in the last session a few weeks ago, um, which were highlighting small, small nonprofit kinds of businesses. What can you do on a dime? Um, and one thing that really stuck with me is meet your people where they are. And if we embrace sort of a consumer customer focused point of view and how we think of solutions in this space as well. so. Um, so asking what that group would find helpful. And you know, we have lots of ideas in, you know, in the chat, people are doing things, but remembering to ask the people who are trying to serve and help, what would be of value to them? And then how might we build that um, way of decompressing that makes sense for them? And I know one of the companies last, or groups last month, um, you know, the people that were working in the office, um, central versus those that were um, in the, um, in the warehouse kind of facility had different ways of wanting to decompress and engage. And they came up with creative ways of meeting those two different groups where they were. Um, so that would be my encouragement is to take the same customer focused view we do when we sell our stuff to bring it internal as we also think about um, this, this challenge. So Sarah Gomel, you have our final question. Great, thank you so much. Um, I work at a tech startup and we are high on creativity but low on funds for things like CSR. Um, but I have been tasked with creating a program and I think it's really exciting to be able to take advantage of some of these new opportunities um, of engaging the whole company, for example, in remote um, purposeful activities. So I was wondering what your advice would be for where I should start in creating this program. So we'll make this popcorn style, whoever pops first, and we'll make sure to get to everyone for both your thoughts on this and any parting shots you want to share with our network. 
Let me go first so our experts can conclude. Um, I'll just riff on what I just said. I'd start with some customer discovery. I think the very fact that you are talking with people and wanting to design this will in of itself be uplifting. So I would go with um, talking with your customer, your employees and your group. Uh, I, I would just say that, I mean, there are three functions, right? You have time, talent and treasure. You may be short on treasure, but there is enough talent to go around that we don't really recognize. We know somebody who does spreadsheets in our office, but might be great in belting out Frank Sinatra or whatever. And you can make a good fun activity around those types of talent that people bring to the table, which are often hidden. We don't ask in a CV, what do you do otherwise? You know, so I think we can balance out those three T's in, in different sections of our, of our life of work together. And I would um, both, I think so well said, I think it's, um, and I'm happy, Sarah, feel free to email me if um, for some specific stuff, we have a lot of just great kind of eBooks and guides, especially when you're starting off, despite the fact that a lot of the client partners I mentioned were large corporations. You know, we work with companies as small as, you know, a hundred people. And so I think um, there's definitely not a one size fits all, but I would echo um, both of, uh, you know, Dean Menon and Murado in terms of finding out what's important to your colleagues, um, unifying potentially around uh, one or two um, uh, cause areas that tend to really surface to the top, whether it's building some volunteering around it virtually, you can do that oftentimes, you know, at no additional cost. It's a little, there's a lot of resources out there I can point you into. Um, and then I, I think ultimately that the small acts of kindness piece that I mentioned can be really powerful many times. Um, and it's, um, just giving people, letting them know that whatever is important to you and whatever really makes you feel better. You know, of course I focus my remarks on, on doing social impact and kind of more on the corporate social responsibility piece, but it could be what, what, how can we support you from a mental health perspective too? And that can be a, a virtual yoga class or, uh, you know, um, uh, one-on-one -on -one, uh, coffee conversations with a mentor or something along those lines. But I think listening to what's important to the team, putting together, you know, a small strategy around that and to, to be able to, to make that impact, to, to do the storytelling and inspire them down the line. And then, um, you know, really uh, making it possible and, and, and tangible where it doesn't have to be, we're doing a huge fundraising campaign. It could be actually, oh, you, you did this really nice, small thing. Um, let's recognize you for that. We've also seen, especially small organizations, really find traction by um, doing a little, you know, friendly competition who can, you know, uh, do more small acts of kindness or, and then, and then recognizing um, after as well. And it's a way to, to bring everyone into the fold, but i um, happy to also point you, uh, like I said, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to point you into some of those little uh, workbooks that, that make it um, easy and actionable too. Well, this was an extraordinary panel and just to bring it full circle, you know, we started with best of times, worst of times and Galton put in the chat a really sobering question, which is, are we ready that over these months ahead, we are likely to lose people from our professional community, as well as in our personal lives and have we built the connections to withstand that and so that is clearly the worst of times part of this moment. The best of times is that we have seen that what matters more than ever is that empathy and kindness and the businesses are not going to be remembered for the exact business efficiency decisions they made over this year, but how they led with humanity and how they truly showed their character. And so that part is the best of times. And I think much of what we learned here today, which is more necessary than ever in times of crisis, is actually urgently needed every day in business. And hopefully as we come out, we see that getting people engaged, dealing with mental health and having this much more global understanding 
will ultimately benefit us all for much time to come. So thank you to our extraordinary panelists for laying that out in such a compelling way. And we look forward to continuing the discussion with all of you as you aim to put this into practice for your workplaces. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.